Good morning and welcome to the Underbrush, a Liger Studios podcast where we uncover the secrets of marketing. I'm joined here this morning by Sue Ellen Daniels, uh, founder of Meals by Grace. Thank you for having me. I'm Absolutely. excited about today. Yeah, good morning. Um, so we'll, we'll do this um, kind of an ebb and flow little thing. This will be a, a fun show, I think. Uh, a lot of good stuff to come out of this. Um, but first, Sue Ellen, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, maybe your background and how you got to where you're at today. <laughs> Well, I don't have much of a background. I'm just a kind of a boring, <laughs> typical mom. You know, three grown children now, uh -huh. like, you know, three grandchildren kind of thing. So, well, children aren't boring. So, no, well, no, <laughs> certainly not. But our journey to where we are is not typical. Uh, in 2010, when the economy crashed, we lost everything. Mm -hmm. We were uh, helping a startup company in the technology field. We had taken early retirement. My husband and I, Steve, were both in the technology field and took early retirement to help a startup company. And it just so happened that the software product we were developing was in the commercial real estate side of the world. Okay. Oh. And uh, when that happened, uh, we lost everything when the economy crashed because it happened to be the commercial real estate side that crashed first. Mm. And we had basically three days to get over our shock and denial of, oh my heavens, we have nothing except the house and the car, everything else is gone, and find jobs. And at our age, we put out thousands of resumes and couldn't even get an interview. And wow. we were just in that place where people would not hire us. They were hiring younger talent. Mm. And it was go find a part-time job because the house payment's going to be due no matter what. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with seven part-time jobs between the two of us. Wow. And the world ground to a halt and all of our friends stepped back away from us, not because they were being ugly, mm -hmm. but because they didn't know what to do with us. This was new. It was unheard of. You know, what do we do with them? We can't invite them out. They're working seven jobs. They don't have time for us. And so they stepped back and we had this big void in our life mm. and had an opportunity to do a service day with the church we were attending. Mm -hmm. And through that service day, we're kind of upset that people that we thought had need didn't show up. And it was like, we need that food over there, by the way. You know, I don't know why they didn't show up. They obviously didn't have any need because I'm not too proud. I'll take it. <laughs> and found out that the reason that the people didn't come was because they didn't have transportation. They couldn't get to where we were. Our mm. county doesn't have public transportation. And the person that was explaining this to us added, you know, you'd be astonished how many children are going to bed hungry every night. And Mama Bear comes roaring out and yeah. I'm like, what do you mean there are children that are hungry that don't have, have food? And they were like, yeah, they, they go to bed hungry every night. And I'm like, no, no, not on my watch. We're gonna feed these kids and Steve's like, okay you know that kind of that panicked husband right, thing right I don't whatever know what she do. says <laughs> yeah I don't, the right answer here seems to be whatever you want dear exactly so um i got with the school social workers and said what do you need and they said well what we really need is someone to home deliver food meals to these families and it would be even better if there was a hot meal like mm. on sunday afternoon sunday evening because there's 40 percent higher usage of the school clinic on monday morning than any other day of the week and i'm like what the heck, why? You know, it's a school clinic, I'm thinking sick. And she said, well, kids that go to school hungry that haven't really eaten over the weekend have a tummy ache. Mm. And when they get to school, they identify that with being sick. And so they want to go to the clinic. And we just discover that it's really hunger mm. is the issue here. And I'm like, sign me up. We'll feed these kids. I had no idea how big the problem was. I'm thinking, yeah, there's a few kids. You know, I can feed these kids. You know, I'm, I'm a Southern mama, you know, I'll fix a casserole, divide it in half, take it to them. So yeah, I thought the, I thought it was going to be so simple. We'll just feed these kids. Right. Uh, yeah, not so much. Mm. Um, and interestingly enough, it's been 10 years since that happened. Had no idea what a nonprofit was or how you started one, how you run one, anything. And it's been such an incredible journey. But the Heartbreaking part is mm. there were just over 8,000 children on free and reduced breakfast and lunch in Forsyth County la that year right. in 2010. This year, 2020, 2021 school year, there are 8,300 and 13 children on free and reduced breakfast and lunch. The numbers have not gone down. Mm -hmm. They went down just a tiny little bit. Mm -hmm. when the economy was great. But the reality is for a lot of families, the problem doesn't go away that easily. Sure. So it's been a very interesting journey. Mm -hmm. One I wouldn't trade for anything. You know, you, you think about the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. Would you change that? 
well, you know, God promises to make beauty from ashes yeah. and good news from terrible things that happen in our lives. And this is one thing that I wouldn't go back and undo as painful mm -hmm. and as long as it has felt like it was to struggle. Mm -hmm. I still wouldn't change it. That's awesome. Um, so is it just you and your husband? Uh, who else is involved in, in Meals by Grace? Is it a We've got about fifteen people now, which okay, is wow. blows my <laughs> mind. Yes, it really does. I mean it's a pretty high turnover kind of industry because nonprofits don't pay exceptionally well. Sure. So it's a, a great place for second chances, we say. We're a ministry mm -hmm. of second chances because there are people that have made mistakes in their lives and they've paid pretty high prices for those mm -hmm. mistakes and they have trouble getting back into the workforce mm -hmm. and they have trouble getting a job and they're very humbled by the things that have happened to them and they come to us usually through community service or some such venue and then they stay because they love what we do and at some point we even find a way to hire them in and to give them more stability more help for their families mm -hmm. or their circumstances so we love being able to do that it doesn't work out for everybody but sure. it's a great starting place for a lot of people so there's about 15 of us right now we have two truck drivers you know because we're picking up resources all over the area down atlanta Wow. Everywhere. Yeah. So one of, one of the things that you, you talked about um, that you put in here was, uh, and this may fall in line with, with some of these people that you're bringing on board, is, is finding your purpose. And so, oh, wow. you know, how, how, can that, how can you explain that a little bit um, deeper of, of finding your purpose and, and how Meals by Grace, may, uh, maybe by itself, is, is helping people find their purpose and that, yeah. finding, finding your purpose? Well, um, it's obvious I'm not a young person, so I've got uh, several decades of learning <laughs> this. So way back uh -huh. when Rick Warren wrote his book, The Purpose Driven Life, mm -hmm. I read it, and then our church did a sermon series on it, and then I read it again. I mean, right now it's like one of those rubber banded books where the pages are falling out, right, dog yeah. and they're all highlighted, you've got <laughs> notes written off to the side, everything's underlined at this yep. point. You know, the very first words in the book are, it's not about me, and mm -hmm. I'm like, <gasps> Yeah. shattering so I started way back asking everybody I met what's my purpose help me find my purpose what's my purpose mm -hmm. and people were like how do we know what your purpose is we don't, yeah. I don't know we're not you <laughs> yeah we're not you what's your purpose you know, they'd ask me all kinds of bizarre questions and the answer was always I don't know I don't know I don't know and so they would finally grind to a halt and go listen just keep asking just keep searching and when God's ready for you to know he'll tell you and I'm like great yeah. I'm going to be Moses in the wilderness. I'm yeah. going to be 80 years old, <laughs> and I still don't know my purpose. I don't know what to do with this. And interestingly enough, it's really true. If you are asking mm -hmm. and you're open mm -hmm. and you watch mm -hmm. uh, when God wants you to know, when he's ready, when you're ready, you'll know. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a little bit on the dramatic side, I guess, but you know, God probably knew that's what I needed. It was like all the sound left the room, and I just knew. I knew that I knew that I knew that feeding children was going to be my purpose, which is interesting because growing up, I grew up in West Virginia, so a little tiny state, okay. um, rather backwoods, mm -hmm. you know, hillbillies, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. mountaineers. Yeah. So, um, Moonshine. <laughs> yep, yep. Grew a, a lot like Kentucky in yeah. a lot of ways. <laughs> uh, everybody makes fun of somebody, so everybody makes fun of West Virginia. Yeah. But growing up in the era that I did, there were really two choices for girls. You were a nurse or a teacher, hmm. and that wasn't what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do either of those things. I love teaching. But I didn't really want to be a teacher. I really wanted a bakery. But I didn't even know there was such a thing as a baker or a chef. I don't know how I thought pepperoni rolls got made. I just loved them. You know, it's the home of the pepperoni roll and all that. But I loved cooking and baking. And, and I, my earliest memories are of standing on a stool with an apron with my grandmother, you know, making things. But that wasn't offered as an option to me. I loved graph paper and drawing. Give me a pencil and a ruler and I was happy for hours. But girls, I mean, I couldn't even take drafting in hmm. school. So I didn't understand how to even find my purpose. But I would tell people who don't know their purpose, mm -hmm. don't ever quit searching. Mm -hmm. Because when you find it, it lights up your world. It's the difference in black and white and color. Wow. I mean, truly, it lights up your world. It gives you purpose every day and meaning. And you can't wait to go do whatever it is. Because you can't call it work. You can't call it a job. Yeah. Because it has so much deeper meaning than that. Wow. Yeah, and that's, um, that's 
pretty impressive to, to explain it in that way. It's almost like the middle of the Wizard of Oz. Like you're going from black and white and then all of a sudden, wow, yes. I didn't know I was blind, but now I see. Yes, it is exactly like that. And that's how you know when you found it. Mm -hmm. Is because everything changes. It's not a drudge anymore. You don't mind getting up. And I would say guard against becoming cynical, especially in my industry. How do you mean? In the nonprofit world, when you're caring for people with needs, regardless mm -hmm. of what those needs are, if it's children in a musical or you know literary, you know education for us, it's feeding. Mm -hmm. You have to guard against becoming cynical. There's so many people in every audience. There's a few that are like they just need to get a job, kind of stuff. And it's so easy to get sucked into that cynicism, especially if you run into people for whom it's not the ideal scenario, and mm -hmm. maybe they're working the system or something. And, and you have to guard against that. You have to watch. If you find yourself becoming cynical, I would say either your purpose has been fulfilled and it's time to move on and find a new purpose. Because I don't believe, you know, these people that say, oh, there's one person in the world that's right for me. And if I miss them or lose them or whatever, you know, it's not that way. You know, God right. is, a, is ever present everywhere, mm -hmm. all the time. So if you fulfill your purpose, there's a new purpose. There's something new for you to seek to do. And if you find yourself becoming cynical, I would say it's time to look around and ask yourself why. Because as a cynical person, you're not of value anymore in the industry you are. As a matter of fact, you'll repel donors, you'll repel volunteers, right. you'll repel employees. Do you really want that? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. then you're all alone and yeah. then you gotta do it by yourself. Yeah, and then you become even more cynical. It becomes a right. dark place. If you're in a dark place, seek the light. Yeah, I like that, that's, that's powerful. If you're in a dark place, seek the light. Yeah. Mm. Because that's where the color is. You can't see color in the dark. <laughs> Just that's, that's absolutely right. Um, so kind of moving along the lines of, of um, you know, the food is the reality of food insecurity. And so how does that, how does that differ from hunger? Oh, can't promise not to cry. Let me tell you how I tell you a story. That's, okay. This is how you know. So early on, we got a phone call from the school social worker because all of our families come to us as a direct referral mm -hmm. of a school social worker. So early on, I got a phone call and I remember very clearly, it was a Friday afternoon and it was like 4.45 or something like this. And she called and said, I've got a family that really needs some help. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a grandma and a mom and a couple of children and we really need you know, to start food service for them. And I said, okay, give me the address. We'll start this Sunday. And she said, well, I, can, I don't have any way to let them know you'll be coming. The little girl's already left uh, to go home on the school bus and they don't have a phone and they don't have transportation. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need that. And I said, that's okay, <laughs> we'll just show up, <laughs> which is not ideal. That's not usually the way you wanna do it, but um, right. but it was early on and we were still you know, personally delivering all the time. And so we show up and it's a little single wide trailer a very neat little yard. You know, they've, they've taken basically what we would consider junk and used it as decorations <laughs> for their yard. Um, and we knock on the door and they're a little hesitant, but they see we've got food and so they open the door and invite us in. And in the back of my mind, I remember thinking, they really don't have anything. I don't see any of the typical things you would see in a kitchen or right. even in a house. But you know, we delivered food to them and they were thankful for it, but it was a little bit awkward. It always is the first time you deliver, and we left. So we left them food, and, and we went on. Hmm. Monday morning, my phone rings, and it's the school social worker, and she said, you're not gonna believe this, and I'm like, uh, catch me up, what are we talking about here? Yeah. And she said, the family that you delivered to last night, Sunday evening, she said, the one with the grandma and the mom, and I said, yeah, and she goes, the grandma just went to the neighbors and called, and I'm thinking, oh no, something's happened, and she said, no, let me tell you what, what it is. She said, the grandma called to say thank you because she said, I was really worried that what we were gonna do, she said, when you all delivered last night, they had been without food for three days. Oh my gosh. And I'm thinking, they had a two-year-old. I've had two-year-olds. I, I have two-year-old grandchildren. They don't take no for an answer real well. They don't wait, they don't have patience, they don't understand. What do you tell a two-year-old who hasn't had food for three days? Mm. How do you make that okay? Mm. And she said, it was just amazing. That's hunger in a way we struggle to understand, being completely without food with a two-year-old for three days. Wow. So where, the, where this gets more interesting is a week later. 
Hmm. So a week later, we deliver again. This time, they're on the front porch waiting for us. They don't know exactly when we're going to arrive, Sunday afternoon sometime. Right. They're out waiting for us. They come running to the car. Everybody wants to help carry something. They're just jabber, 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 lots of hugs kind of thing. It was just really amazing. It was just, it was a fabulous experience. Lots hmm. of hugs and everything. Monday morning, my phone rings again. Wow. It's the social worker again. I recognize the number. I answer the phone and she's crying. And I will tell you, if you know a school social worker, if they've worked for more than a year, they don't cry. I mean, they've seen it all. They've yeah. had to guard their heart from some of the horrible things. My little things sister's just, in social work. Yeah. I mean, you know, they have to guard their heart. So after a while, they kind of become hardened a little bit by choice. They compartmentalize that mm -hmm. pain. So she's crying and she's trying to tell me what happened. And I'm like, oh dear, I'm thinking, because it's the mom this time. And I'm thinking, oh, something happened to grandma because she's oh, not no. in real good health. I'm just imagining everything. She said, no, she called to tell me a funny story. She said, but it's not really funny. And I said, well, tell me. And I'm thinking, you're going to need tissues for this one. Right. And she said, so the, you have to understand this was like November and the time had changed and it's dark outside. The little eight-year-old girl mm -hmm. got everybody up in the family, including the two-year-old, mm -hmm. at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning in the dark. Get up, get up, get up, everybody up. We have to start cleaning and, and putting things away and making it look nice, just in case those nice people bring food again. Mm. You see, food insecurity is when an eight-year-old gets up at six in the morning mm -hmm. to make anything within her environment right that she can so that it won't interfere with them having food. Mm. That's the difference in hunger and food insecurity. Mm. Food insecurity doesn't leave a child right. just three days without regular and reliable and healthy, nutritious food forever alters the chemicals in a child's brain. Mm. It doesn't go away. I have pets that were raised in a food insecure environment mm -hmm. that are now so fat they can barely waddle. <laughs> but the reality is they still hog the food bowl Yeah. because you never forget. If you see an obese adult, mm -hmm. Odds are somewhere in their family heritage, there was hunger and they learned habits that they can't overcome and they don't even understand. Hmm. Food insecurity has to be dealt with very quickly and very early right. to avoid that. Right. And so part of, part of what you do, um, I would assume is just the education of this because you know, myself, um, and I'm sure yourself before you got into this, just not aware of this. I mean, we, we live in a country of surplus and yeah. you know, I can have this whenever I want and just instant gratification. And so to know that this is happening right down the road, yeah. I mean, it's, it's eye opening, right? And, and it said, you know, I said there were two jobs that were open to people growing up. You could be a nurse or a teacher. Guess what? I get to yeah. be a teacher. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I really do. And it is education and it's education in totally different ways. There's, I mean, I, we live in one of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States. Mm -hmm. So to a great extent, all of us live in a bubble mm -hmm. and some by choice and some just from ignorance. They don't know. They don't believe there's a problem because they've never seen it. So part of what we do uh, in our ministry is we bring volunteers in and we home deliver is to educate them, mm -hmm. educate them. Let me take you down the road. Let me show you the poverty in a way that you and your family can understand that this is going on. You don't have to buy a plane ticket and raise money and go on a mission trip overseas. Yes, there are issues there, but you could take that same money and you could make such a difference in your own mm -hmm. backyard, yeah. so to speak. You could do mission work here where right. it's needed. You can make a difference in your child's school. There are children everywhere, even in the wealthiest of schools, there are still issues of food insecurity and hunger. So yes, there's education there, mm -hmm. but then there's the education of our own families, the families that we serve, and we call them neighbors most of the time. Okay. So the people that we serve, the neighbors that we serve, there's education there. And it you have to build relationship. One of the reasons we love home delivery mm -hmm. is because, well, except for COVID, that's been a real problem. Sure. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, we're in the family's homes and we're delivering food, we're building relationship with them, and we, we encourage um, volunteers to really bond mm -hmm. with the families, and some bond very well to where they share family birthdays together and oh, do all wow. kinds of things. But even for the families that deliver sporadically, when they build that relationship with mm -hmm. the family that's in need, 
there's a level of trust that develops and the family will start sharing other needs and other things will become apparent that they need. And it's an opportunity for us to start one-on-one -on -one mentoring with them, mm -hmm. share life skills. I mean, you'd be astonished how many families don't know what a budget is. Wow. They don't know how to manage the money that they have, mm -hmm. or they've never really had money to manage. They'd like to have a car, but they don't understand the expenses that come with having a car. Um, they would like to feed their family better, but the word nutrition is not a word they're familiar with. They don't know what a protein is and a carbohydrate is. And mm. what would be, how do you make a menu? What's the value in having a menu? When you go to shop, you know, how, how do you make good choices? And how do you turn those choices into healthy food for your children? Mm -hmm. You know, obesity in a lot of cases is because the food they're able to purchase, the inexpensive food, is really low nutritional value. So there's a lot of education. And then there's the job skills. We had um, a family that the dad had lost his job. He was a screen printer. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't even know what a screen printer is, but he had lost his job because mm -hmm. that's a sunsetted skill. He didn't have another skill. So the mom, they had three children in the home. The mom had gotten a job at McDonald's because McDonald's was open 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so she could work at McDonald's at night while dad was with the kids. That way they didn't have to have childcare, okay. but they were struggling to make it. Well, she was walking nine miles at night. Wow in any weather wow. to get to this job because it's what they had to do to survive. So there's job skills training that's needed. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do a one-on-one -on -one mentoring with someone and teach them to do all kinds of things, right. but you have to be allowed into their lives, invited sure. into their lives. So we get so many opportunities to educate the public, the families that volunteer with us. We love it when families bring their children and come and serve. Yeah. Uh, when things were normal back in pre COVID days. Boy, yeah. I hope we get there soon. Oh my gosh. Me too. Yeah. We had kids in the kitchen day because families would bring their children to serve and they wanted something special for their children. So we would do kids in the kitchen day mm -hmm. and we would put away the knives and the hot things. And we would do kid friendly meals that we could make for the family. So the children could learn about health and nutrition and taking care of one another. There's so many lessons that we could teach them. And we love because so many young families right now, they want their families to, volunteer with them and wow. serve with them. But that was like, okay, we need a venue for that. So, you know, just, we didn't know how to do it any differently. So we just created it for them. Wow. That's so awesome. Um, I don't remember where this was said, so I apologize to whoever said it. I don't, I can't give you credit, but it was, you know, real, real change doesn't happen until those that are unaffected are convinced. Ooh, say it again. So, Real change does not happen until those that are unaffected are convinced. It's so true. And You're so for, for people like myself that are um, relatively unaffected, other than you know seeing it on the road as I drive by or hearing the stories from close friends, personally, I'm, I'm not affected by it, yeah. right? I mean, I, I woke up this morning and uh, I had a cliff bar, right? I had, I had something to eat. I got a glass of water. Um, yeah. I, I can't had a imagine. Hot shower. Had a hot shower. Yes, man. There was the greatest heat. invention. <laughs> yeah, there was heat in your apartment or your home, mm -hmm. and you went out and got in your car without probably even glancing to see if there was enough fuel to get you to work. Yeah, yeah. So many things that you you, know, you didn't worry. Do I have any clothing? Did you know? Is there a way for me to wash my clothes? Mm -hmm. You know, do I have a w access to a way? You yeah. know, that flies almost in the face <clears throat> of the for someone who is a believer, mm -hmm. no evidence is necessary. Mm -hmm. But for someone who is not a believer, no evidence is sufficient. Yeah. So it's kind of a piece of the same puzzle. When you look at it, they seem opposite, but they're very much the same. You have to have an experience. The experience is the catalyst sure. that flies in the middle of that and changes it. Because you're going down, you've got this preconceived notion of, what poverty is or isn't, or what life is or isn't, what my neighborhood is like, what my community is like, what my city is like. And then all of a sudden a friend tells you a story or they say, hey, come and serve with me and you go have an experience. And it's a jaw dropping experience and you meet a family and you think, oh my heavens, this family lives less than a mile from me. Mm -hmm. And these children have nothing to eat. 
and we brought them food and the children literally as we drove up you could see little heads popping up in the window yeah. and as you walked up the steps you could hear them running through their home and you know the little hispanic children will yell comida 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 mm-hmm. you know they're identifying yeah. to the family food is coming you know there's a meal on its way and they're so excited mm-hmm. and we think wow I've brought groceries home before and had to go inside and drag my kids off to the Game Boy <laughs> to come carry the groceries in. And these children are thrilled because people are bringing food. They don't even know what it is. They don't care. Wow. So it's a, it's a paradigm shift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a change of mind and then it's a change of heart. Yes. Which changes our actions. Absolutely. And that's <clears throat> whenever, you know, um, Mahatma Gandhi is one of my heroes and says, you know, let change begin with you. You be the change Mm -hmm. you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I didn't grow up, I may have grown up in West Virginia where there wasn't a lot, but my family wasn't in need. Mm -hmm. Now my dad tells stories of of growing growing up in need. He lived in a boarding house when he moved out Mm -hmm. and his landlord would let him put ketchup in hot water to make tomato soup. I mean, so I grew up with stories of what hunger was, Mm. but I never experienced it, never saw it. My family didn't volunteer or do anything outside of our church. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You almost have to have an adult experience if you didn't grow up with it Mm -hmm. to change that heart. Yeah. There's a, um, so I have a guilty pleasure. I listen to a lot of Michael Jackson. (laughs) He's on my playlist. I'm just saying. He has a song, Man in the Mirror. Um, Heal the world, so, man in the mirror. You know, starting starting with the man in the mirror. Yep. You know, that's how you do it. Start start here and then expand. And the song with the children, Heal the World, Make It a Better Place. Yeah. It It's really up to us. And I think a lot of us <clears throat> excuse ourselves. No mm-hmm. guilt. No guilt here. But yeah. the truth is we excuse ourselves from doing something because we think one person can't make a difference. Mm-hmm. But there's that little boy, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a real story or not, or if it's a legend, but you know, the little boy that was walking down the beach and that had been one of those weird tides that came in and it had dumped thousands of starfish mm-hmm. onto the beach. And he's frantically throwing them back in the beach, throwing them back in the water, throwing them back in the water. And there's an old man walking toward him and the old man is just shaking his head. Like, what are it's you like, doing? yeah, what, you know, why are you wasting your time? There are too many of these to make yeah. a difference. You just can't make a difference. And he's just doing it. He tells the little boy, he says, you know, this is stupid. You might as well just give up. There are thousands of these. You're one little boy. You cannot make a difference to this mm-hmm. many starfish. The little boy looks at him, nods, reaches down, picks up another and throws it in. He goes, it matters to this one. And we use wow. that all the time in our ministry. We onboard our employees by telling them that story and saying, you know, we don't have to change the world, mm-hmm. but we can make a difference to this one. This yeah. one family, this one child, mm-hmm. we can make a difference. You'll never allow yourself to tell yourself that you can't make a difference. If you just find one person to help. Absolutely. You can change the world one mm-hmm. child at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all it takes. Is, I mean, it's the power of multiplication. You know, yes. One becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. Exactly. And it, it's, it's really not that hard. But everybody looks at, and myself included, I do this as well, is well, there's seven or eight, eight billion people in the world right now. So, I mean, that's a big number. That's a big number. So I can't talk to eight billion people. You don't have to no. just talk to two people. It's, and if everybody just talked to two people, yep. I mean, it wouldn't really take that long. It's the law of what is it, six degrees of separation. And who knows? It's probably five now. There's so many billions of people yeah, in the world. Yeah. But the truth is you don't have to change the world by yourself. Mm-hmm. You just make a difference in your little corner and mm-hmm. invite somebody to join you. And then they'll go off and their life is now changed because of you. And they'll make a little difference in their corner and they'll invite somebody to join them. And little by little by little, that foundation gets bigger and stronger. And I mean, we have an aquaponic farm, which is off the charts weird when we tell people we have an aquaponic farm they're like you have a what yeah and invariably when they say it back to me they say oh you have a hydroponic farm no you weren't yeah. listening this is what you'd like to say but no we have an aquaponic farm oh and they look at you blankly and you're like mm-hmm. okay you know hydroponics they put chemicals in the water to fertilize the plants because mm-hmm. water in and of itself doesn't have sufficient nutrients mm-hmm. aquaponics while the word aqua means water and so mm-hmm. does hydro okay so aquaponics is fish you put fish in the water. God created this really cool symbiotic relationship where the fish 
do their business in mm -hmm. the water. And those nitrates and, ni and nutrients in mm -hmm. the water are what are the perfect fertilizer for plants. How cool is that? Perfect fertilizer for plants. So why is that important? Well, because families in need eat a crappy diet because mm -hmm. it's what they can afford. And typical pantries give them canned goods, dry goods, some frozen meat. It's not really the epitome of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So what we want is really highly nutritious food. We want to pique their taste buds with something really, really new and good and fresh. So we were looking for a, a venue where we could get fresh produce. Right. Well, we couldn't find it anywhere because by the time a store pulls their produce, and gives it to the food bank, mm -hmm. and the food bank lets us get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already what we call lettuce soup. You know, it goes straight <laughs> from the box into the dumpster. You don't want to give your families that. It's nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. You're not going to teach them to learn to love fresh things if it's really like that. Yeah. So we started an aquaponic farm, and that's a great place to come and volunteer. Wow. You can come and feed the fish. You can come and harvest mm -hmm. and plant and learn all about the life cycle of growing. But you've never tasted lettuce or cucumbers or strawberries or even fish hmm. until you've had something that fresh. Right. So it was just such a great way to change the world. You can do aquaponics anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. You just have to know what is the topography? Do you need pumps or can you use gravity? And what is the climate? Do you need shade cloth or heaters? So you can do it anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, that means effectively we could change hunger in the yeah. world. Because those that have money would love to buy that fresh, organic, premium quality sure. produce and food, and they'll pay top dollar for it. Mm -hmm. Then you take that money and you buy the subsistence food yeah. that's needed for families in need. Wow. So it's a life cycle where we can take care and change one that. another. Well, we're getting a little pressed for time. Um, I did want to give uh, just the chance, if, if the viewers want to get in contact with you, how do they... How do they volunteer? How do they give their time? How do they how do they come and help you with Meals by Grace? So the best way to do it is to go to our website. So mm -hmm. mealsbygrace.org, O-R-G, so mealsbygrace.org. Yeah. And you can register to volunteer there. You can find out about us. You can make a donation. Uh, we invite you to come and volunteer. You will have the time of your life. And there's something for everybody. The farm, home <laughs> delivery, yeah. working in the client choice pantry. Mm -hmm. We'll even tell you what a client choice pantry is. Yeah, because I don't know. Well, next time. <laughs> I'll come and find out. I would love that. That would be, be awesome. Please do. Well, Sue Ellen, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Um, I, I can tell just by the, the tonality of your voice how passionate you are about this and, and really bringing um, the, the awareness to how much hunger is out there and the solution of just one meal at a time. It's by community one for community. Time. That's I love that. how we do it one at a time. Well, thank you all for joining me. Uh, again, my name is Dakota Ward. This was The Underbrush, joined here this morning by Sue Allen from Meals by Grace. Thank you. Thank you so much.